If you can stop talking for 10 seconds, that would be fantastic. You want to hit the start timer on there? You want to hit... You want to start podcasting, genius? Florida. Uh, anybody here from Florida? Woo! Nice, there we go. I, uh, I tried to describe Florida PYC. Have you guys seen the original Jumanji? That's, that's Florida. The whole movie is basically what if Florida was a board game. Giant mosquitoes, crazy old man, that's Florida. I moved here, I thought the Boston accent was amazing. You guys took an already established language and you're like, fuck that show. <laughs> like, fuck your T and fuck the letter R. That's the history of Boston. First time in history, white people gentrified other white people's shit, so. <laughs> I moved to Lawrence, Massachusetts. Are you guys familiar with Lawrence? Yeah, yeah Lawrence is probably the worst place I've ever lived. <laughs> that means a lot coming from me, because when I was little, I used to live in a man's testicles. This is a true story. Anybody else? <laughs> so, yeah, that's funny. Hello, and welcome to Carnival Personnel Sideshow. We have the whole kit and caboodle today. This is Jacques. This is Biff. Go. <laughs> and uh, and we have, a, we have a guest today, uh, another stand-up you know, buddy of mine who I met maybe three months ago uh, at the hole in the wall called The Safe in Lowell, and just a really, really, really funny guy. Uh, I've always loved, uh, you know, I like his delivery. His material is great, but he just has a very cool demeanor. Um, he's hosted. Uh, you know, I've done an open mic that he's also hosted, and he also has done uh, Greg Bogus's uh, Mondo Comedy over at the Lunar Theater that Joe and I are. Uh, regular guest. I don't think I've missed one since coming back, since Greg come back from COVID. I don't think I've missed a Mondo. Um, and Joe's made most of them. But anyways, enough of my yapping. Uh, everybody, please say hello to our good friend, Praise EJ. What's happening, man? What up, what up? Uh, have you done a podcast before? I've done one podcast with my friend, Paul Bort. <laughs> Oh, Paul's Paul's great. Paul Paul hosts a podcast called uh, the the Winter uh, uh, Open Mic, the Winter Hill uh, Winter Hill Tavern, no Brewery, Winter Hill Brewery in Somerville. Yeah. yeah. And you and I both saw him last night, uh, baking for heroin from the stage. <laughs> <laughs> No, his whole bit his whole bit was you know just circling back to so seriously does anybody have heroin you know and it was i didn't think you had to beg for heroin in some of <laughs> well that's somerville that's somerville oh, sorry. well i don't think you have to beg for heroin up in manchester too hard anyways but yeah but he he is a really 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 funny guy too uh I'm just going to dive right in. Praise, how the heck did you fall into the awful meat grinder world <laughs> of stand-up comedy? You know, it's a sad story. I moved here, and uh, Massachusetts is very depressing. <laughs> <laughs> I needed to find something. How something dare you, sir? <laughs> I'm sorry to everybody in Massachusetts, but yes, it's very depressing. <laughs> Especially because of COVID and, and the winter and, and yeah. You move you move from Tampa, right? Yep, Tampa, Florida. And, and, and Tampa, Tampa, to uh, you know, it says uh, on the Instagram thing, Lawrence. I know you do a lot of things, which I've always considered Lawrence to be the Tampa of Massachusetts. To be honest, <laughs> I resent that. <laughs> <laughs> um so that that's it when she moved up here you're like i gotta bring some happiness in my life so you did the most depressing thing possible you got it to stand up it's ironic i thought it would you know something that would be so wholesome and make people laugh turns out to be <laughs> pretty bad sometimes 
you know, it's funny. Joe and I moved to L.A. in the 90s. And when I got into comedy, same thing. I was just I had a lot of time in my hand. I was so excited. I couldn't afford acting classes. So I'm like, ah, I'll give this a try. I, mean, I had a lot of actor friends and I'm like, dude, it's all confidence and ego. If you could do stand up, you could do that. <laughs> Sir, no, I'm serious, Biff. I'm, I'm on all those sets with all of our friends. Biff and, Biff and I played hockey with like do more celebrities than you can. I mean, it's stupid. But all of them, I'm like, dude, you've got no talent except you're overconfident, you know, and it's like so I started doing stand up and I, I liked it. Uh, like Joe and I did a lot of writing, just a ton of writing. But praise, it's the same thing. It's like just being at open mics and even regular comedy clubs with comics was the most fucking depressing thing <laughs> ever miserable motherfuckers my, my favorite thing is when a comic is just having a really bad day and instead of working on material that they know is funny they just let it out on stage and get no laughs and bomb but it's cathartic <laughs> for them but it's also really sad I you mean, know, it, it, all, a lot of open mics are just self-serving, you know, it's just like 12 people waiting to just hear themselves talk for five minutes and then that's it, you know, like if they get a laugh, great, if not, fine, you know, at least I got to say my piece. Mm. No, I, you, you know, Price, you're right. It, it's the worst part is somebody's having a shitty day. They are literally taking it out on their audience. And most of them, <laughs> no, most of them are their friends. Are like, oh you know, there, there's all these clicks at, at every place I've done. I've been doing it five months now. And, the, and this click here and that click here. And different, and different clicks bleed over to different places. You'll see two or three people at each, each, each mic, you know. But, there, but there's clicks within each one. And they're taking it out on their friends and then getting mad at their friends even more for not laughing, laughing. At, at their rants about them being <laughs> seriously it's it is this cycle of like it's like being married to 10 different people at once you know right <laughs> you know and, and i love it it's like well fuck you guys that's funny it's like you, you know lot a most of the time it is funny, but we've heard it six times the last three times you've gone up there and also We've just seen 20 other people waiting to go up there unless it kills or catches you off guard, you know, and, and you know, I try, I try to be really supportive, but then again, you know, what I found, you know, what I think is depressing praise is it's always the same guys who are outside when you're up there or they're in the back of the club being louder in the back of the club than they are when they're on the stage with the mic. <laughs> It's like, dude, it, this is, you know, it, it all sucks. It, it sucks for all of us. Can you at least be quiet while I'm trying to suck up here? You know, but uh, but so why? Why do you do it, Praise? What, what, the, what the fuck? <laughs> why do you leave the house and come to, to the, the holes in the wall I keep seeing you at? You know what it is? The first time on stage is like super thrilling and exciting and addictive. That's really what it is. It's just addictive. It's so like any other thing, like heroin, nicotine. So you get a few laughs and it feels really good. And you're like, damn, I want to do that again. So you do it again. You I th take it out, but you can't, you can't quit, man. I think it is Lou Reed who said that, 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 you know, heroin is like heroin. No, he said the first time you do heroin, it's like kissing God. And every time after you're chasing that feeling, and you never get it again. Like, like you, the first time you do heroin, it's hands down the greatest time. And every time you do it after that, you're comparing it to it and you just don't get there. But it's heroin and you can't stop because you do it once and you are addicted. Seriously, heroin is a one time and you're addicted. So, but then, so do you have an approach like that that you have a uh, praise? Like, what's your, you know, I, you know, when I, when you write your material, think of your material, like, you know, is there kind of a method to your madness? Uh, I don't think I good enough for establishing <laughs> <laughs> to have a good answer for that question. I just write whatever I think is. Yeah. And then a lot of times it's not. <laughs> so then I throw it away. Sometimes it is. And then yeah. I, I was just going to say this because I just thought of this. I think the first time you do comedy, you always come on stage like this is the first time I do comedy. Everybody is super supportive and they give you so many laughs. And you're like, wow, I could do that again. But then 
the more experience you get, the less they – they give you a lot of sympathy laughs the first time. <laughs> I want to get that level of laughter again, but you can't. Mm. That, 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 I think, yeah, you are fucking – you're onto it. That's exactly what it is. You know, no, because, you know, there was a woman – I don't know. I know. I don't think you were there at, at the um, – up in Manchester a couple weeks ago, a middle-aged woman who's a dentist who got up for the first time. And she did okay, you know, And but that's exactly it. She really got the, hey, this is her first time up. She's there with her daughter, everybody. You know, and even the jokes that were okay got great laughs. She would get so much support next time, but in three or four weeks, if that material isn't crisper, if she's not hitting it better, it's kind of like, you know, you're just another piece of shit like me. Fucking, you know, get this five minutes over with and get the fuck off. You know, from now on, I'm just going to say it's my first time I do comedy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you know, it's funny because it's a similar thing. So Joe and I have been stapled together like since 94. And when I got to do uh, Mondo Comedy in December, it's the first time I did it in a real room with real people. And even Joe was like, dude, that was weird. People actually laughed and, 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 and I was different. So I did it in December. I go to the show last month in January. I didn't know praise was on. You know, I just go to Greg's show every month. And I have at that point seen you 15 times at different places. Always a fan. But I told you afterwards, I'm like, who the fuck are you? Like, where did you, where, <laughs> even his joke that we just joked about that he's been working on forever, uh, even that, you know, got great laughs, but you were, you were a completely different guy. Like, absolutely. And I said, I said, I don't know what the fuck you ate today, but eat a lot more of it going forward. Cause you, that night, dude, you just had the entire, and it was a packed house, absolutely a sold out show. And there wasn't anybody who didn't think like, okay, th 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 this kid's been doing this for like 10 years and is just awesome. I mean, honestly, I, I don't, I don't know what, you know, what it was. What did you feel about that night? Why was that so different? Do you think? Oh, first of all, thank you very much. I appreciate all of that. Uh, tickles, tickles my heart. Um, I don't. I feel like when it's when it shows versus open mic, I feel like I come in with a little bit more like determination. I guess like more more focus. It's yeah. I think I come in with a little bit more focus when it's a show versus when it's an open mic. Um, so I think that kind of explains a little bit of the difference. <laughs> It was a really good show. Everybody smashed. Everybody killed. Peter Lou was on there. Chris Tab, who's the first time I've ever seen him. Oh my goodness, he demolished. Yeah, that, that 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 whole that whole night was. Abs if if everybody did five more minutes, it would have it wouldn't have been too much for anybody. It was, it was a great night. I've also, like I said. One night you hosted over at the safe. You you killed. That's not an easy thing. Yeah, hosting is a lot more difficult than I than I thought um, until I actually did it. But yeah, it takes a lot of. You have to. So I feel like people have like batteries, laugh batteries at an open mic. After twenty comics, you're not laughing as hard as you were, you know, the first. Even if it's funnier. So as a as a host, you got to keep the same energy for twenty comics. Do jokes in between. It takes a lot of effort, yeah. Well, I, I've seen at the bomb sh the bomb shelter. I saw it, I saw it once at the bomb shelter, and and once at uh, Winter Hill. After ten comics, the host switched out because it is it is a different energy. But I, and you know, I, I just recently saw a guy that you know we do stuff with who hosted somewhere, and and he, you know it was actually. It was actually genius and its subtlety. He just went up and goes, that was great. That was praise. Let's hear it for praise. Okay, now let's keep it moving. Joe, nothing else. Like, you get the fuck off. Biff, get the fuck up. Biff, get the fuck off. Joe, get the fuck up. You know, Joe, get the fuck. And it, instead of having that extra 90 seconds to two minutes between, uh, you know, and after 20 comics, that literally saves a half hour of your night. Uh, but but yeah, did you did you know you were gonna host that night, or or, or was or was the guy just like, hey, can you do this? 
Yeah, he told me a couple of days before, so at least I had that prepared, knowing that I was going to host. But yeah, I didn't expect it to be such so draining. Um, <laughs> but I survived, so <laughs> I would definitely do it again. I feel like hosting is probably one of the best ways to like get better um, because it's it gives you so many reps and just one night. You know, you could do five minute open night open mic night one place but if you host you're probably doing five minutes you're doing like a minute in between every right day. right so that could be 20 minutes total and that's you know more practice i guess uh we, we had a guest on a while ago uh sally mullins and she is she she's just one one of my favorite people and one of my favorite comics and she she's you know touring in comic for 30 years i've seen her host a lot of shows and and she does the classic host thing that is a real skill set. She pulls one thing out of your bit yeah. and riffs on it, you know, kind of with you as you're getting off the stage, you know, walking away or something like that. She she finds like one one of your things and finds a fun thing, you know, to kind of war, you know, not not like workshop it or punch it up, but kind of rift along with it and kind of keep the energy and applause for you while bringing the next person up she doesn't go up it's like okay i did my five minutes and now i'm going to do one minute my material between she does one minute with your material in between every person and she and a lot of the people she'll know but like any other thing even though it's a book show at like the comedy store she does or this place called federal bar uh, it's still you know a comic she's seen 10 times, but they're going up with new stuff that she has to riff off of. So it is, it's, it's something that I kind of think I would like, but at the same time, yeah, that's a fucking long ass night because you, you can't dial out. You can't go outside for 10 minutes. Yeah. That's a kind of a stylistic thing too. Right. I mean, it's like, I'm sure that there are people who do great at, you know, doing crowd work. Like, I don't know what your approach is uh, praise when you're doing your, you having to host versus, um, because obviously you have to, you know, you you can't be, you know, you can't just be there with material all night, right? So you kind of do, do you kind of prepare differently, or do you have things that you kind of look for, or you know, pick on audience, anything like that? Oh uh, yeah, when I hosted, I kind of just wrote down all the bits that I wanted to do, and then I would just pick one for in between the comedian to do that. Yep. Or like, unless if they said something that really grasped me. Mm-hmm. That like, took me a certain place and gave me a, a funny thought. Then I'd be like, okay, I'm gonna skip my little bit. I'm just gonna talk about that. Um, and it worked for the most part, but that's also, you know, that's also risky because you might you might have a a funny thought, something that you think is a funny thought, and then you get on stage, you want to riff about it, and they're joking. Nobody like, uh, right, right. right. <laughs> do you uh? Do, oh, do you get out of here? <laughs> Do you have a writing process? Do you have like, okay, I'm writing every day or I'm going to put these notes in my phone as I think these thoughts and on Saturday, I'm going to block out two hours or what, what is your writing process? And do you have a person you either write with or have a sounding board? It's completely all over the place. Sometimes I have like a note like of a sentence and then I go back to it like a week later. I'm like, oh, maybe I could try to write something. Sometimes I something just funny comes up and I have to sit there and I do like write it all out. Um, I have been trying to write at least one little joke before I go on stage every time. That's like my new thing. And I think that's helping me at least getting me more reps. So every time I'm doing an open mic, I try to write at least like one little thing, even if it's like a small, silly joke, um, just to have something new and fresh. But yeah, it's all over the place. I did try a writing session, like a group of teams who came by, we kind of like had soundboarded our ideas to each other. That was pretty helpful. I'm still trying to find what's what's like the best one for me, to be honest. I've been all over the place. Um, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's it's. I mean, I, I, I honestly, I, I'm really lucky because, you know, uh, the, you know, the first the, usually uh, the dub the dub. <laughs> Poor Joe, <laughs> you know, as much as as much as Biff puts up with me and our other friends where, you know, Biff, Joe and I are in a hockey chat, like text, they like four other buddies and they have to hear my nonsense on an almost constant basis. Every idea or kernel of an idea I have before it gets from like 
the back of my brain to the front of my brain, I call or text Joe and I'm like, hey, what if I have something about a make a wish kid wanting to be in a snuff film? You know? And I text back, stop. <laughs> every time every stop. time his note is why are you doing this just just stop but that, that's a kind of interesting like do you do you have um people you bounce stuff off with are, are you just are you just bouncing stuff with your you know within your head or are there people who you work with stuff on um once in a while <clears> it's like i'm just in a conversation with people and then it reminds me of like a bit that i wrote that's when i take the opportunity to be like oh speaking of this i also thought about this bit what do you think because most of my friends are stand-up open mic or comedians, so yeah. it works like that. Other times, I just get up on stage and try it out at open mics, and then that's my immediate feedback on whether it's <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, that's that's a lot of people do that. But what's what's funny is every comic has this, and it's the same thing. You'll go and do something, you know, you know, at the safe, and it fucking kills on Tuesday. Yeah. And then you go, you know, because on Tuesday, if you time it right, you can do, you know, you can do the safe and then you can get to Somerville and do the joint or you can do, you know, Winter Hill and the joint because they're both in Somerville and it will kill. And, and, and if you record it and you play it back, the cadence was the same. The pacing was the same and it fucking dies in one room. And you turn around and it just slays. I mean, where are the places that you. And have you found like, okay, this kind of material works here and this kind of material works there. But when I do the same thing and, and, and vice versa, it dies. Have you, have you started to figure that out? Um, well, I, it really 100% depends on the audience, right? So if I, I've gone to shows where it was mostly older people. So I basically just decided not to do anything that I thought would be too like young to too young for their ears the references that they probably wouldn't get um that's when you break out sample and some references yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i gotta bring out the, the old throwback references and stuff but um and i found out a lot of older audiences appreciate more cleaner comedy for some reason at least around in boston area when i go to new hampshire because new hampshire has mics it's a completely totally different thing everybody likes the most raunchy dirty no matter what age they just like penis vagina jokes that's what it seems like to me well it, 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 it's so it, if, if you have you purposely like okay i gotta work this bit out i know this bit isn't right in this room but i got a booked show coming up and i got to find I got to make this land. I, I it's 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 70% there, it's 80% there, but before I do it in front of pay people, even though I know it's going to die, I have to work this. Have you gone through that? Have you like got up there at a certain place you're like, "All right, this is going to be a fucking long 10 minutes. This is going to be a crucial, you know, just excruciating five, but I have to do this even though you know it's not going to land." All the time. <laughs> All the time. Cuz I feel like you have to do that to get it um to the next step so that's one thing that i've been trying to work out things on stage um i know i've heard a lot of people say that that's that's like you work it out off stage and then you like do it on stage you go back you work it out off stage again but i've been trying to like work things out on stage and just letting the idea like riff and talk about it and then hopefully something hits and i'm like okay i've recorded that i'm gonna go back and you know that's what i'm gonna say again um but yeah, all the time I get up on stage, I kind of just like, let's see how this goes. It's all in the air. It could, <laughs> could be good. It could be really bad. Who cares? As long as it's an open mic. If it's a show, I'd probably, I'll probably be a little bit more scared of trying. <laughs> yeah. I, I, so when I started, uh, you know, Joe and I did a lot of this stuff in the mid 90s. And so just before the pandemic, I was going to try to start to do things for a certain reason. The world went sideways. So now that I finally got a chance, the only open mics I knew about the first two months were out in Worcester. And I kept, you know, and it was tough because I would be talking to Joe most the whole way out. And I'd be like, okay, the worst part about this is I have an hour drive and I have an hour to talk myself into turning around and not going <laughs> and doing it. Like the joint is honestly three miles away. Like, like I can go, if I sign up early, 
if I get there and sign up early, I can be home by the end of the second period of a Bruins game in my pajamas. You know, cool. But I know there's certain things. And it's funny because, you know, I have a friend who I meet in Worcester. He, you know, he can only do shows in Worcester. Um, House arrest bracelet. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but but it's funny. It's like that to everybody in Worcester. It's uh, but it's like it wouldn't be in Worcester, right? Right. (laughs) Right. It's actually a penal colony. Nobody knows. (laughs) They just sent prisoners to Worcester. You know, it's funny because penal colony, penal colonies, as in the penalty and not penis colony. I just want to make sure. Hello. Have have you seen this? <laughs> Have you seen the shows in Worcester? <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's funny. It's funny, praise because I had a I lived in LA for like twenty years, and I had to shoot this thing, and I, I had never been to Bakersfield or Fresno. Honestly, both of those places make fucking Lowell and Lawrence look like oasis. It's okay. Okay, imagine a a much more depressed Lawrence. <laughs> but 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 a hundred and ten degrees all the time, <laughs> you know, and and I'm doing this project and I'm I'm talking to these really nice guys. It was this M. I was shooting something for the uh, for MMA, uh, for the UFC, and I'm thinking it's like okay, two and a half hours that way is San Francisco, it, 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 it's Sacramento, you know, it, 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 it's it's that two and a half hours the other way. It's Los Angeles. It's San Diego. If you got a working car, why the fuck are you here? (laughs) It's like, and I do when I go out to Worcester and I'm like, dude, you know, like, oh yeah, yeah. Like eight, and and it's, it's, it's the same with like, you know, Lowell. Look, we love Lowell. You know, we're having, we've been here four or five years. It's fine. But there are some Worcester people who can't possibly imagine moving to shrewsbury like like why would i leave this oase anyways but it's funny the guy who i'm doing it with it's awful the places out there are really tough for the most part it's 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 hunching down it's it's all guys like i walk into a place there's a, there's a couple places i go and if there's 18 guys praise 17 look like me 10 years younger or 20 years younger but it's all this proud boy light like punching down like fest and i keep driving out there i kept driving out there uh i, I only go out on mondays because i can do two in one night but it's like that thing where okay this is gonna suck but i need stage time like hosting you you know all the stage time like you were saying i mean that's just there's no substitute for it but yeah i mean there's just those times where you know you're gonna You're going to, it's just going to be suffering. I, you know, and the safe is one of those places for me because I am honestly, and I, and I don't kid when I say this, I'm probably older than everybody there's dad. (laughs) I mean, mean, it's funny because we have this friend, this kid. Is is that, is there going to be a question here? You're telling a story. There's a, there's this kid, Owen, who I talked to his dad the other day. Great. Owen is a fucking right. That kid, that kid, it hits your trade of fucking anyone listening. That kid is doing something, but I talked to his dad. It's just funny when his dad mentioned something and it's like, yeah, it's like when I was born in 74, I'm like, fuck you. Just, (laughs) I'm going to go sit down. But no, if you want to kill at the safe, you know, it's, it's like, for me, I have nothing but dated references. But if I go into the safe and say, oh, my God, I got so high at work today, dude, it's going to absolutely fucking kill. And I can't do that because I've never got high. But like you said, if you go to Winter Hill, you're going to get you, – you can do that at the safe and you're going to kill. Yeah. But at the Winter Hill, where is the place that, that you like doing it other than book shows the most? Where is the open mic that you're like, okay, this is the right fit? Yeah. Cagney's and Quincy that's probably my favorite open mic right now there's usually a decent amount of audience which is something you don't get at open mics you usually just get more comedians who are just judging you while you're on stage (laughs) and not laughing because you know they've already thought about you know premises like that before or something like that but um Cagney's it's it's a good atmosphere the host is really great Shay she's awesome um yeah that's my favorite place to work out material right now <clears throat> and that's a haul. That's like an hour for you. Well, the, the safe is probably forty minutes from half hour. The safe is much closer. The safe is like twenty minutes from me. Cagney's is probably thirty to forty. 
Now you take 95 south or you take 93 <laughs> south or do you hop on route three and then take the left at the <laughs> the donkey Jones with the wicked fat kid selling fireworks uh okay and and how do you how when you start now how long have you been doing this uh a year a solid year, yep, solid year. did you know anybody when you started it no i just knew the two or three people I met at the first open mic that I did. It was three of us. Me, a guy named Ma- Maxwell Schultz, I'm sure you've heard of. A guy named Freddie Sabelli. Uh, also, shout out Freddie. Uh, if there's a show. He's doing a show tomorrow. I don't know if this is going to be released the podcast. This will be a week from this Monday. Oh, okay. So the show would have passed. But the show is probably great uh, when you guys hear this in the future. But yeah, it was me, Maxwell, and Freddie. Freddie at an open mic, so it was three people to open mic, and that was the only people that were gonna call me when I first started at One Broadway Collaborative. And I went there like faithfully every Monday, <clears throat> and I was just having fun trying to make Freddie and Max laugh. <laughs> I was just trying to make two people laugh in that room. Dude, that that's fantastic. And 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 the show you're referring is that the one at UMass Lowell. Uh, it's at One Broadway Collaborative, actually. It's at their new building because the old building caught on fire. It's a game show slash comedy show uh, on the 18th. Oh, wait, wait, hold on. A, ga- a game show type thing? Like a, 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 a roast battle? The best part of it is I have no idea how any of it works. Oh. <laughs> I'm, I'm part of it, and I'm just going to be just as surprised as the audience members when I get there. So I'm excited. Dude, that is fantastic. And and so now, like, you know, you pretty much every time I've seen you walk in a room, it, it, it's like, oh, his royalty showed up and I turn around. It's like it's praise. And it's like so now you, you, you know, all these people. I mean, you have a really support group. When you were saying you have people come over to work together. Is it some of the people that I've seen at the different places or is it a different group of friends? Yeah, I did one actual setup writing session that we were like, all right, we're going to do a writing session. It was me, uh, Fredo Cruz, which I know, and Carolina Montesquieu. Oh, actually, I did two of those. We did those twice. And then we had uh, a vest join. These are all people who faithfully go to One Broadway with us. Um, the first time, it kind of just, we just goofed around. And the second time, we just goofed around. <laughs> so so it's a, it's, it was a writing, quote unquote, writing session. It was just like a hang. And then there were probably a few good things that came out of it. I think everybody was like, ooh. No, the, I mean, over the pandemic, when I was trying to do this, I, I, you know, and Joe was part of it. Over the pandemic, I did two things. I, I, I wrote a feature script, and it was great because I think I had like 20 people on the Zoom doing a table read, which I can never thank my friends enough to do that because it, what, what was that, Joe? It ran about four hours. You know, it was like a hundred twenty that, page. That's because script. you stuck for three and a half of it. Though. No, no, that that's the, the whole thing is <laughs> I did it. <laughs> you know, we we actually had a a host, a, a buddy of mine, like read the camera directions and all that stuff. But but Joe and Joe was also you know reluctantly part of a little comedy collaborative where I had like four or five people who've all done stand up at different parts of the country and I felt bad because everyone's like oh I want to do that it's great and they would sing clips when they had done comedy you know at these different places and every week for like the first like four or five weeks it was just me trying to work out stuff and then be like oh okay caroline what do you got it's like ah i'm not gonna do it this week but uh here's my notes on your stuff i'm gonna do it next week oh all right right, jenna it's like oh well uh i didn't get the chance to write anything but here's your and and then it's like i felt really bad because it was like okay these are my like my this is my writing team (laughs) right no 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 it it was like leno and his writing staff it's like okay what do you got for me guys what do you got you know and it was just like four people writing jokes for Jacques. Uh, I, I, you know, yes and no, Joe. I wrote the jokes, but you guys made it funny. Like, it plays, it sucks because it, I, I'm going to do, you know, you know, when I do Mondo next week, I'm going to say, I know already going in, the four biggest laughs I'm going to get, I came up with a premise. I came up with the, 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 the setup. Uh, but either Joe wrote it or Caroline wrote like one of those guys like, yeah, that's okay. But here's hey, something you know funny to say. Had, Eddie Murphy had Paul Mooney, you know, yeah, so <laughs> they all, everybody has their team. But, but, had writers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, 
and, and it kind of it kind of faded out. I really was hoping to have and, and it's funny because the open mic at coffee and cotton is really great the guy who runs it at coffee and cotton inside mill number five it, it's fantastic but i'm friends with the guy who owns it and i was talking about putting together an open mic this is a year plus ago but i didn't want to do an open mic i wanted a i wanted to put together an open mic so i didn't have to drive anywhere that that, that was the you know the big thing and i was hoping to put together like a comedy collaborative where okay you go up but you can't hand the mic to the to the host and leave you have to stay and at least punch up one joke of the next three people after you you know type thing i was really hoping to put something like because there's been times when and it's been really nice there's been times when i've handed the host the mic back to the host and somebody's come over and goes dude that bit about this was really good um if you say this, or what do you think about this? Or, oh, it made me, and, and it's like, oh, holy shit. Yes, yes, that is a lot better. Yeah. And it's absolutely great. And there's been other people, there's a couple people who I now now know in Worcester a little better who will ask me, it's like, hey, can you record my set and, and, and tell me what you think? Like tomorrow. And it's like, and I will. It's like, as Joe calls it, I like to beautiful mind stand up just like break things down like methodically but but it's true i mean i love that like i i love writing in groups it's 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 so much more fun to be in a room full of fun funny people the tough thing is if you're in a room of fun funny people you end up joking around for two hours and actually getting shit done yeah exactly so uh yeah the one broadway collaborative open mic that i first did they kind of did that since it was just a small amount of people it was only three of us. We could have decided to, you know, might as well just like after you perform, we'll give you tips. A lot of the tips first started off like just, you know, not necessarily about the material, but more about like presentation on stage. And then eventually evolved into giving like, oh, what if you said this, what if you said that. That was really cool. It is, I get what you're saying, what you said a little bit earlier about like, it is, it always feels weird if there's like a, a difference in um, level of providing, I guess somebody's providing way more and you're receiving more where it always feels weird and you want to provide you want to match it so i guess yeah uh it would feel weird if if that was the case or some type of imbalance but um yeah i think a lot of a lot of comedy just comes from like saying something and then somebody looks at it with a fresh eye with fresh pair of eyes that you haven't looked at it yet because you've been so focused on but, right yeah so uh, oh, uh, yeah so it's a twofold question. Like who are three or four of the people, like the comics, the household names that you like, and who are a couple people that you see yourself in the same like box with? It's like, you know, it's like you might love like, you know, anybody, you know what I mean? You, you might love like, you know, Bill Burr, but you're not in that box. You're more in a box with this guy. Who are two of the three of the comics that you absolutely just if there's a if there's a Netflix special, you're gonna drop what you're doing to watch, and at the same time, who do you put yourself in the same box with? When you say box, as in like style or comedic style? Yeah, yeah. Like 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 I love Tom Papa, and I don't try to be Tom Papa. But if I was gonna say, okay, I'm not high energy. I'm not I'm not Bill Burr. You know, Bill Burr is excited and high energy. Uh, I would say I love him. He's one of my favorite, but I, I I would fall, you know, my cadence and delivery would fall more under a Tom Papa thing. Okay, okay. Um, so people that I love, oh my gosh. Eddie Murphy is goaded. I don't know. Eddie Murphy is goaded. I really like Louis C.K. and how he delivers stuff. Um, Dave Chappelle, of course. They, any of those guys put out a spot. If Eddie Murphy came back to stand up, oh. I'm, buying, I'm buying those $300 tickets. Yeah. No, dude, dude, if, if Eddie Murphy comes back, and, and it's funny because the best, the best of the best, like, like the people who are just legends, yeah. the way they talk about Eddie Murphy. Like, like you, you, you know, it's like it's like you, you know, uh, a Michael Irving who's won three Super Bowls, who's in the Hall of Fame. If you ever hear him talk about Jerry Rice, Michael Irving talks about like, yeah, I was really good on the junior varsity high school team I played on. Too bad I didn't go anywhere with it. I mean, he, again, 
that guy's in the Hall of Fame, three Super Bowl rings, and he calls Jerry Rice Jesus in cleats. And that's <laughs> That is literally how every comedian I've ever seen talks about Eddie Murphy. If he comes back, I mean, Kevin Hart last year did like a stadium tour, but honestly, it, it would be it, he he would he could only perform if he did a real tour. It'd be at Foxborough Stadium, it'd be at Gillette Stadium, it'd be at the Meadowlands, it it'd be at be a Tokyo tour. It Dump. Would be a one night event, because right? Eddie doesn't need to tour. No, I, mean, I think we got close until COVID. I think like he was doing the movies, he was coming back, and then COVID hit. And then we yeah. went to America. And I think there was a momentum. He was going on Jerry Seinfeld's show. And I was like, oh, is he gonna is he gonna come back? Is he gonna do just one special? One special. And no. I think he I think maybe COVID kind of smartened him. I'm like, wait, I'm Eddie Murphy. I don't need <laughs> to do stand up comedy and be, and then like to also see all of the criticism surrounding comedians lately, you know, especially high profile comedians. Maybe Eddie Murphy was like, I don't need to subject myself to that because he is a controversial or he had a lot of controversial stuff and maybe Eddie didn't want people digging up his old stuff and like hey <laughs> were you the guy who said this? were you the guy who said that like yes I was well you know, it, it, it's yeah. funny because Eddie Murphy just gave just got an award within the past few months like a lifetime achievement awards and he didn't give a long speech but even in his short speech he was Eddie Murphy and he's like in all my years I've learned three things um oh fuck i can't remember the first one was like whatever it is mind the second business. yeah mind your business huh. mind your business pay your taxes yep and keep Will keep Chris my name. fucking name out of your mouth and like <laughs> nobody like people have made jokes here and there but he's the only one who could like literally put on the helmet and run through the wall and, and even <laughs> will smith be like yeah, that's fucking funny. That's that's Eddie Murphy, man. He can say what he wants. So those 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 are the ones that are up there. But now, who do you see? Like with your cadence, your delivery. Like if somebody, if 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 some agent came along and said, you know, praise, you're kind of this. Hey, I kind of would. I love you. I love you to put you out there with this person and this person. I'm gonna sell you. I'm gonna I'm gonna book a tour. It's like, hey, this is the next this guy. This is the next this guy. I just wanted to say the other thing that's really amazing about Eddie Murphy, he was like 21 years old when he put out his first special and he sold out a stadium, which is like, what? I mean, he, he was 18 on Saturday Night Live. Yeah. Early 18. Yeah, there, there was, um, so this was is. Delirious? Is it? There was Delirious was the first one, Delirious right? Was raw and Delirious. Then the Raw was the one that Raw was 88. One. So, so I, I, I praise, if you haven't heard of this show, it's on Netflix. It's called The Movies That Made Us. And it's 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 a it's and they do it's a two uh, it's an hour. It's an hour documentary about coming to America. And it, they talk with these two writers who were writers on Saturday Night Live and they're like here's this kid, he's 18 and nobody's writing for him. He's good, but nobody everybody wants to write for whoever the big guest is that week. And these two guys are like, "You know what?" This guy's good. We're going to write for him. And they write a bit, and I think he was on the news, like his first time on national television. He's 18 years old. And here are these writers that's like, fuck him. He has no right going up there on national TV his first time yeah. and being a 20-year vet. just for, And then because they were like, oh, we're just going to write for him. And then Eddie Murphy was like, yeah, you guys want to write a movie for me? And they, then they end up writing some movies for me. But here are these guys who are surrounded by the best writers, the funniest show, and they see this 18-year-old kid, and they're like, yep, yeah, th th we we are 100% hitching our wagon to this guy. And like you said, by the time by the time he does Delirious, by the time he does Delirious, he's been doing stand-up for five years. You know, he probably had his, quote, 10,000 hours in because by the time, you know, when Saturday Night Live scouted him, he's 17 years old. Yeah. He, you know, he, he was like young, early 20s and delirious. Yeah. yeah. Right. But early but to do a stadium early. tour and, and that can pull, you know, he's and, and that's the whole thing. I mean, he, he's been doing stadium tours since the early 80s and, and didn't fall off. Like, have you seen documentaries about George Carlin? George Carlin killed it absolutely was fucking it and for 10 years almost went away 
you know, and, and then he it, it, it got to the point where, you know, uh, they're making fun of me now. Like, like he came the butt of the jokes for some other younger comics, like, you know, were pointing out that he's old. And then he came back. Eddie Murphy only went away because Eddie chose to go away. Like if he he would have he never had a lull except, yeah. I'm going to take a couple of years off and spend time with my 10 fucking kids. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he's put out so many movies consistently. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can just say a lot about Eddie Murphy. I and mean, he did have a few movies. He had um, You People. He's in You People now. Yes. And he had another one that just came out, Dolomite. Oh, yeah. they called Oh, it Joe That's loved him. So great. That was an amazing movie. Holy it was shit. great. Yeah, yeah no. he did Coming to America, which kind of like, I was watching uh, movies that made us. I think they had an episode on um, Coming to America, how it was like the first American movie that sold really well in like Africa. Huh. Yeah. 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 And so it was a big thing because people didn't think they could like, market that, that type of look. Well, 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 that was that. And they threw in. Um... That's why they ended up putting Louis Anderson in there because there's no way a total black cast will carry this movie. It won't sell. We yeah. got to put this guy in it. And he wasn't, no, he wasn't huge at the time, but he was, you know, he was more of a name. But it's funny because, you know, now in, in that same documentary, you see the guy, uh, oh, fuck me. Joe, who am I thinking of? Good times. Yeah. I mean, he's talking about how. He'll see people at parties cosplaying as uh, McDougal employees and yeah. McDowell employees, and 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 uh, you know, and dressing like the different you know characters in that. No, and and, and seriously, and then you and then you turn around and you see, um, oh God, who does who does the Medea movies and all the parody movies? It's like Tyler Perry. Tyler Perry. Tyler Perry is great. But Tyler Perry owes his whole career to Eddie Murphy because, you know, that barbersh- the whole barbershop scene where he's doing five or six guys. And, and that's another part of that documentary where he decides he's just going to fucking walk around like in makeup. He's walking around Queens when he's not shooting, when it's downtime, just to see if he can fucking pull it off and stuff like that. Like, yeah, that guy was OK. Enough about Eddie Murphy. Back to you, praise. <laughs> like, so so. I'm an agent and I'm selling you to a club. I'm trying to put your tour together. Oh, this kid is like this. This kid is the next that. Where do, what what and I hate to throw people into, you know, a category, but who would you liken yourself to? Like who would you say, "Yeah, I can see a comparison to this guy or that guy." Who I I really like the comedy who's uh who I would like to like be like is uh Michael Shea. Um, he's a he's one of the writers of SNL. Now he's yeah, a, he's a he's a man. dude. He's a, he's a, he his 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 bit for okay, the so last before you before you go in there, let's hear what praise thinks about in terms of what's your what's yeah. the Michael J highlight from for you. So he's one of the things is just his comedic style. He's not a very like uh, you know physical comedy guy. He's more uh, cerebral, and he'll just stand and talk, and it'll be cool, calm, collected, almost conversational. And that's what I tried. What I definitely try to do with my comedy. It doesn't always work, but I try to, you know, keep it more about the words that I'm saying, and then, you know, then the stuff that I'm doing on stage, which is uh, why I liken myself to him. I think he's also got some very, you know, he likes to tackle like really strong subjects. He doesn't shy away from the tough, tough topics, and uh, I would like to be able to like attack these big, the things that people get uncomfortable with. I would like to make people uncomfortable and then laugh at it. So that's what that's why I kind of like. That's my inspiration right there. But um, yeah, yeah. No, he has a great bit about um uh his his special uh, his was it six or eight episode special, where he talks. It cuts back and forth between stand up and skits. He talks about, yeah, cops suck. Yeah. Oh, damn, Michael K. And my brother's a cop. <laughs> and it's like, so, so he's like, yeah, cops do suck. Everything you hear about cops suck and all. But at the same time, you know, I got a brother who's a cop and I kind of hear 
this side of it. So, you know, and and it and it's it's not the most popular thing, you know, for black comics to get up there and say, yeah, not all cops suck <laughs> because <laughs> you know, uh but yeah, but he does it. He doesn't shy away. And what I was going to say on SNL, his thing with him and Colin Ho- Colin Jost. Colin Jost found him on a scouting trip and and hired him. He goes, this guy's great. And the running bit of Michael Che trying to get him fired for the last five years. So the Christmas uh, the joke exchange. And, and, but, and, but, great. but he just constantly hashtags like fire Colin Jost yeah. <laughs> on, a re- on a regular basis. Uh, no, and, and and then he's the guy on the you know more more than Colin Jost, who plays the side character to whatever crazy skit they're gonna do, whether it's a uh, the drunk girl at the party or you you know what what whatever whatever that. No, he is he, okay. I can definitely see you and you and him in that same thing. You know, that's is there anybody else that you like? Yeah, I'm kind of I like this guy. Um, big name or. Or just somebody that you like that I we might have known. Uh, like if you say Ren from from the safe, I'd be like, okay, he's great, but Joe doesn't know. Joe doesn't know. Ren's fucking maybe funny. Somebody, maybe somebody we don't know. Maybe we can like you know spread our wings a little bit. Uh, what's his name? Nathan uh, Barzetsky. How do you pronounce his last name? Nathan Barzetsky. Is that is that how you pronounce it? I'm a, I don't know. I'm asking. Uh, uh, is he like a? Is he on TV or is he like a? Local? Yeah, he's got a, he's got his Netflix special. I think he's got two on Netflix now. Bargatze, that's how you pronounce it. Nathan Bargatze. If you guys don't know, you should check him out. Look him up. Okay. Um, he's, <laughs> he's a he's a super southern guy. So he's got this like slow, uh, almost dim witted delivery, but it's all very like smart witty comedy. Oh, that's great! Yeah, there's a, there is there's a wave I've seen, you know, just because I'm I live on Instagram and Twitter. There's a wave of Southern, really smart comics, like like they 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 have that whole, you know, yeah, we're from here kind of thing. I get it. I talk like this. This isn't a this isn't a bit. So I can't, you know, and, it, you know, but then again, you know, the New England accent doesn't lend itself to such a, such a, oh yeah, that guy sounds wicked smart. Uh, so, so is your family supportive of this endeavor? Oh, uh, my parents don't know that I do comedy. <laughs> oh, that's a riot. <laughs> so that's that. So Jacques's been doing comedy for some time, and I don't think your parents know you do comedy. No, no, no. <laughs> well, I, 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 are your parents up here with you? They, they back in Florida? They're back in Florida. Okay, all right. So you, what, what the hell do they think you're doing here three, four, five nights a week? They just think I'm just a very busy, and I have a really good social life. All right. Okay, <laughs> well, you do. Them. You do. Yeah. <laughs> Going all night to, with a bunch as of people. As much as you can in Massachusetts. I mean, you know, it's the most depressing <laughs> place on earth. <laughs> yeah. Although you're catching us in a good a good season now because it's not you know we haven't had a flake of snow. Yeah. So, you know, don't have that to deal with. About it. Yeah. Uh, I was very scared of the, what this winter would bring, and now I'm kind of like, oh, that was. Is this your first winter? My first winter was last winter, and I hated it. I okay. It <laughs> yeah. So last... I, was scared. I thought this winter would be just as bad. Funny thing about New England winters, they could they could last until like mid April. Like it could just be like yeah. you know sixty degrees, fifty degrees February March, and then all of a sudden April one, you're like oh two feet yeah, of snow. Yeah, yeah okay. no. One of my favorite things is my senior year in high school praise. I played tennis with a buddy one one day, sweating our balls off. You know, I'm not a good tennis player. He was just hitting the balls at me basically. The next day was a snow day, and and the opening day of the Red Sox the day after was postponed for snow. It literally one day it was like 75 80 early April and then a snowstorm school day the ne- you know closed the next day Red Sox game canceled for snow. It's like so it's been great but eh, hold on a second. Oh. Bipolar weather. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, did I hold on a second. I hit the wrong button cuz I'm old. There we go. 
Biff. You have to Biff, stop the show for a little chat. No, no, Biff, Biff, is, Biff is, uh, has to go to the party. Anyways, so praise. Give me the one, two, five year plan. Like in one year, where am I going to see you? In two years, where am I going to see you? In five years, are you going to be fucking taking mine and Joe's call? Are you, are you going to be comping us tickets at, at, at the Wilshire? Or are we going to have to pay like all the other unwatched fucks lined up to see you? Yeah, I, I haven't thought about this. But let's say in one year, I'm going to do Staples Center Arena. Ah! <laughs> um, Crypto.com. Is that what it's called? <laughs> yeah, I, think they- I, see, I see a lot of people who I kind of, well, not a lot, a few people who I kind of started with starting to like headline shows. Um, I think I, I'm a solid 15. I could do 15 minutes. I prefer like 10. But I think in a year, I would definitely want to be able to do like 20 minutes headlines and shows like that. I definitely want to be consistently getting shows in a year for more, like paid shows. I'm starting to get paid shows, but I mean, I'm doing shows. I would do a show for free. Wait, wait. So, you, so you're a professional comic, you're saying? I made like $10. <laughs> so I, I don't, I think we're not asking about details. You're a professional po- comic. That's great. That's great. Yeah. yeah. You know, you know, we've been doing well, this podcast for five years and we don't get paid in jack shit. Nothing. Yeah. I hate to we tell you this, money on this if it was six, it's been six. <laughs> you know, Listen, Joe's like, hey, hey. But uh, so, yeah. So how? When do we see? When do we see the the the, the Netflix special? When do we see uh, my 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 next my next uh, my next guest needs no introduction from Dave Letterman calling you up? Actually, Dave Letterman called me uh, last week. I think Ooh. next month we're going to be. <laughs> well, Dave Letterman, the he, one he's talking about, owns a deli. <laughs> it's not the David Letterman. It's, it's the A David Letterman. Letterman. It's close. You got to work. You know, work the ladder. So, the ladder. so it's so, actually L E D E R M A Letterman. Yeah, <laughs> David Letterman. Uh, so praise you are a a a a a, a funny young good looking guy who has better things to do on a Friday night than fucking talk to us dinosaurs. So I will let you go. Uh, but I do want to say a couple quick things. That uh, first of all, thank you for jumping on. I mean, I mean, truly, um, I, I've been asking you for like a little bit now. It's like, hey, can you come on our podcast? Because uh, you're really funny, and 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 truly, you're one of the you're one of the comics. And and I said this to Mike, uh, Mike Dupont, who was a guest a couple weeks ago. I, I, you know, between Worcester, the place, the ten places I've done it, I've seen over a hundred people, and there are about ten people who I'm like, that guy's there. It, it's 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 the lucky break it's somebody seeing it on the on the right night that you are in that 10 percent of people like yeah i'm gonna get to say i I knew this kid in a couple years Uh, i really do like your 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 humor is very smart um i like your deliverance i like your cadence and your presence you are truly one of the people that i'm like yeah this sucks driving 45 minutes here and sitting here for an hour but i got to see praise go up there and like i said when, when i saw you at mondo comedy last month i was like i don't know what the fuck happened to you that day that just <laughs> did just uh, again whether you ate the right thing whether uh, you know, you, we know what it is you were in front of real people you're getting <laughs> no 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 you're getting you're getting real yeah. and, and and mondo depending on who the headline is you, if there's 70 people there you depending on the headline because it's always a dinosaur like a guy who's been doing it since the 80s from boston so you'll have 15 people 55 and over you know you'll have 10 people who are like 24 and every and everything in between and no and there's only a handful of other comics there so it's real people and the feedback you are getting the pause for laughter that's it's hard to practice hold for laughter at an open mic when there is none there's no laughter at open mics. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, that, uh, there's this comedian named jimmy tingle he's a uh, massachusetts guy legend. yeah he did a show at one broadway and i got to me and a few comics got to talk to him after and hang out and one of the things he said, which is like really super motivating, was like, if you can get like chuckles at open mics, if you can get like a little bit of laughter at open mics, you will get a lot of laughter at real shows. So that just that kind of explains what the difference is. Well, well, uh, you know what, praise. I tell you what, 
when I, if we're if we're someplace next week, because I, I think I can get three mics in before I do Mondo next week. If we're in like the safe, I swear to God, I'm just gonna walk up and say, "Oh man, I don't know if I can do this. I got so high before coming here." I'm, <laughs> gonna, dude. It's go, it, yes or no? Do I get the biggest laugh? Does that count? Yeah. <laughs> does, does that count? Does that count as getting the chuckle at open mic, even though it's complete bullshit? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Praise, where can people find you in the socials? And so this is going to drop, like I said, in, in, in two, uh, yeah, about like 10 seven. days. So so what do what do you have coming up in, in March that people can, can actually come and see other than shithole open mics with really unhappy <laughs> wanting to kill whole, themselves host? This whole podcast has been shitting on Worcester, open mics, <laughs> um, Old people, I mean, you know, you name it. You know what? I really wanted to shit on Lawrence, but we'll save that for next time. <laughs> oh, <sure. laughs> when I come back and shit on Lawrence, we'll get to the, all the other cities that we left out. Don't We're worry. Coming for you, Lawrence. We're coming for you. <laughs> Does Chevy Wang is now like Somerville is which day? No. Yeah, let's cut a promo to Lawrence right now. <laughs> <laughs> Wherever you live, we will get to your hometown. Don't worry. <laughs> But uh, March 25th, I will be in New Hampshire. I think it's Manchester. Um, let me pull up the details. I, I'm What's your sure. website? Do you have oh, a website? My Instagram is at I am praiseworthy. You can follow me that. I am praiseworthy. And let me find this. I said oh, website we, like I was from like the year 2000. Like, what is your website? Son? <laughs> uh, well, what's your what, what's your only you fans? Have, what's you your only a, fans page? Only. You have your own www. Yeah, a, hold on. HTTP colon <laughs> slash slash. Oh. So it is powerhouse comedy at Jewel Nightclub. And I don't know where Jewel Nightclub is, but I'm <laughs> sure Powerhouse Comedy. That's where I'll be March 24th, Friday. Get your tickets now because they're already up. Mm. Um, it's a show put on by Tori Slaughterhouse. He's also been to the safe. Good guy. There's a lot of people on it that I see. There's a guy named Top Flight. There's a guy named Mr. Coos, Yogi Marquise, Tori Slaughter, obviously, and uh, another little guy, G. Johnson, on that show. Um, anything else? March 24th, UMass Low Show. I don't have a lot for March because I'm, I'm traveling in March. So, but that's cool. all I have March 24th. Well, we will let you go be funny in other places. And honestly, man, uh, it, it, it really is great when I, I, I sign up and I see your name on the list. You come in. You, it, it, I, I so didn't want to stick around last night because I was really, really tired. And I kept like, oh, fuck, be next, be next. Ah, damn it. But I did. I stuck around because I, I, I've not been disappointed seeing you. Uh, you're a special kid. Thank you for doing the podcast. Appreciate it. Anytime you want, I'll come back for sure. This is fun. And then we can bash some other people. Um, <laughs> yeah. we yeah, bring, look- bring a list next time. I, I, I got a, I got a uh, beef to, with Everett, Massachusetts. So let's, <laughs> let's, um, yeah, put that on the ticker. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Praise. <laughs> Let me do a quick demographic check, call and response to assess the demographic. Ear. Cool, cool. That lets me know where all the niggas is at. So. Let me do another one. Can I get a Hoya? All the all the dudes named Trevor. That's, that's <laughs> oh, I did a show in uh, Mattapan not that long ago. They had a DJ to ask me what song I wanted to come up with. I picked Earth, Wind, and Fire. Do you guys listen to Earth, Wind, and Fire? Yeah. All right, me neither. I. Uh, <laughs> I only picked that song because when I was walking to the stage, it, uh, it was an older black audience that smelled like Icy Hot and Shea Butter. <laughs> so, so this is an Earth, Wind & Fire crowd. This crowd's a little different. It's young, mostly white. It smells like Nike Blazers and Air Possible. That's <laughs> Oh
Yeah, man.